Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandy, and today's subject is reconciliation, to make peace between two warring parties. The good news is God's not mad anymore, and the war was over when Jesus Christ arose from the dead. You've been fighting a war that's been over for 2,000 years. Sound good? Let's get into the Word of God together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. For the past three lessons, we have talked about different doctrines found in the Word of God, and I'm calling this Theology Simplified, and I trust you have, that's exactly what's happened to you because of this, that you've been understanding the Word of God better than you ever had before, and finding out these are just big words that sound complicated, but they have very simple meanings. And today, we're going to take up the doctrine of reconciliation. Reconciliation, the actual word in the Greek is katalasso, and katalasso is the procurement of peace between two warring parties. And what we're simply saying today is, is that peace is really a synonym for reconciliation. Peace is God's main message, has always been his main message, Old and New Testament, and should be ours, because one of the first things that Adam and Eve lost was peace. They now suddenly had to do everything for themselves, where everything had been provided by God. Now they had to dress themselves, find a way to dress themselves. Everything from food and everything else was left to them. And so they no more had peace in them. It's really what the world's been looking for. Think about how many peace marches have you seen? How many times have you seen the peace symbol out there? I came up through the 60s and boy, peace symbols were everywhere. Everybody was looking for peace. And oh, peace was something we could just sit down, sing Kumbaya, and everything would be fine. And that's not it. On top of that, they were everybody's against war. They're talking about, well, we want peace instead of war. Folks, Jesus didn't first come to stop the war out here. He came to stop the war in here. He didn't first of all come to bring peace on earth around us. He came to bring peace on the inside of us. You say, yeah, but didn't the angel say at Jesus' birth, peace on earth, goodwill to men? Not exactly. Let's talk about the fact, first of all, peace is God's main message and is ours. It's always been God's main message for the Christian to the sinner or for the unbeliever to the one that doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. Yes, angels announced it at Jesus' birth in Luke chapter two and verse 14. And I know your King James says, peace on earth, goodwill to men. And people have, in fact, you get Christmas cards with that on the outside, peace on earth, peace on, peace on earth. Honestly, the peace on earth isn't gonna come till one day Jesus Christ comes back as the Prince of Peace. But until that time, that's not what the angel said. Let me tell you what the Greek says, and you'll find it in other translations. The angel said, peace on earth to men with whom he is pleased. Who is God pleased with? Those that accept the birth of Jesus Christ, those that accept the coming of Jesus Christ to this earth, those who see Jesus Christ as God in the flesh. So again, what the angel said was peace on earth to those who believe in him, to those who put their trust in him, to those with whom God is pleased. That was the announcement on that day. Who is God pleased with? Those that accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Those that understand why he came into this earth, why he was born, why he was raised, why he had three years of public ministry, performing signs, wonders, and miracles, getting people saved, and then finally going to the cross and dying for the sins of the whole world, and then being raised from the dead. And listen, if you understand that and accept it, you are those who have peace on earth because you know that this is what God intended for Jesus to be. Let's talk about other things. Peace is a title for our gospel. It says in Isaiah 52, 7, him who brings glad tidings of peace. This has always been God's, what God's desire. And it said there, how lovely on the mountains of the feet of them who bring glad tidings of peace. Glad tidings is simply the word good news. In other words, it's the gospel. Who is God pleased with? Those who bring the gospel and the main message of our gospel is peace. It says in Ephesians 6.15 that our feet are covered with the gospel of peace. It says in Matthew 5.9, we're called peacemakers. A peacemaker is someone who's a witness. A peacemaker is designed for those who tell others about Jesus. And if they accept him, then they are peacemakers. Listen, once you get born again, God's desire is for you to become a peacemaker. Become a witness for those around you of Jesus Christ and the fact that he only can redeem you, can save you, can give you eternal life, can change you on the inside and also give you peace. Daily peace 
is supposed to be the guide for a believer. It says in Proverbs 3.17, all her paths are peace. In other words, no matter what path you're facing, is it a business path? Is it a family path? Is it a church path? Is it forgiveness towards someone else around you? Is it walking into a bad situation? Is it a lawsuit? Whatever you're facing, all your paths should be led by peace. Proverbs 3.17. You may not have a voice from heaven. You may not have had a voice from God, a voice from the Holy Spirit, but just stop for a moment and think, do I have peace in this situation? If you do follow it, guess why? Peace is a guide for your life. Isaiah 55 and verse 12, you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. So we go out after we get born again with joy, but now we're led through this life by peace. Peace becomes a great thing for us. I remember when as a pastor, we were looking for another building because we were on 10 acres of which only four and a half of it could be used. The back half was below floodplain. And so people could park back there, but if there was ever any forecasts of huge rains, then people had to get out of there. So we we had a building, but we had limited parking and we began to look for another piece of property and we found one. And so I went to walk on it. I just went out there and stood there and then walked around the property. It was rural. It was about three or four miles from the church building we had, but it was out in the country. And I stood there among the cows, looking at the cows, the cows I was looking at me and I looked at all that property we're thinking about buying and I never had a voice from God. I wish I'd have had angels come and sing to me, Bob, this is God's will for you is to buy this huge piece of property. It was a lot of money, but I looked at it. You know what? I had nothing. I had no band of angels coming. I had no one carving it in front of me, engraved in granite. No, I wish I would have. That's what I kept waiting for, but it didn't come. You know what? I had the whole thing? Peace. I just stood there, looked around. I mean, the cows looked like they were at peace and Bob was at peace. You know what that simply means? That's what I was supposed to do. Colossians 3.15 says, let the peace of God rule your heart. The word rule there is actually the word umpire. Let the peace of God be an umpire in your life. Now, uh, listen, umpires have been there throughout history, but simply to when we think of an umpire, at least I do, I played baseball, there was an umpire right behind the catcher. He watched that ball come across the plate and if it was a strike, he'd yell at a strike. If it was outside, he'd call it, it was a ball inside, outside, or straight across the plate. Again, that's what he would call it for. And that's what the word of God is to us. The peace of God becomes a ruler in our heart and tells you up, no, up, yes, up, no, up, yes. And the Lord can give us peace in the midst of a situation. But I can also tell you this, there have been times when I walked into a situation and didn't have peace. And it's almost like the hair on the back of my neck stood up. Everything looked good. It looked like a good deal. It looked like something we were supposed to do, but something inside of me just went, and there was no peace inside of me. And Hebrews 12, 14 says, follow peace with all men. You know what all men means? Christians or sinners. God wants to guide you. And sometimes Christians will rip you off. And sometimes sinners will offer you a good deal. Oftentimes it may be the other way around, but you can't trust a person just because they got a fish painted on their front door, a fish on the bumper of their car. That doesn't mean they're not going to rip you off. Most of the sins in the Bible are sins of believers, not sins of unbelievers. But again, in situations, it says, follow peace with all men, Hebrews 12, 14. And again, we find that there. And finally, daily peace is to grow and multiply. It is a result of obedience. The more we follow the peace of God, the more we begin to grow. We follow in the word of God and that peace is supposed to grow. It says there in that verse of scripture, grace and peace be multiplied to you. So the peace that I had when I first got born again has multiplied. Now I walk in a bigger peace than ever before. I wake up with peace. I follow peace throughout the day. Again, it comes back to this. Peace is another word or a synonym for reconciliation. Peace and reconciliation are used synonymously over and over again throughout the writings of the word of God. Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter two, and I want to take a look at verses 13 through 17. Here, speaking of reconciliation, again, something that Jesus did for us on the cross was he brought reconciliation between two warring parties. And the two warring parties we're specifically talking about was God and man. Now there's other warring parties that this, listen, the same reconciliation can work in is between man and mankind around us. And we have all kinds of things today that causing uh, disturbances and lack of peace between people. We'll get into that too, just by the time we get to the end of this lesson. Ephesians chapter two, verses 13 through 17 says this, in Christ Jesus, you who were one time far off, 
have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. Notice, Jesus Christ is not only our redeemer, he is our peace. He's called the Prince of Peace. He's gonna come back one day, but Jesus Christ is your peace. Once you have him, you have peace. The only time you can leave that peace is when you get out of fellowship with the Lord. You get into carnality, you get into sin, and the first thing that drops off is peace. God wants that peace not only in you, but to continue to multiply and grow. Verse 14, for he is our peace who has made both one, that's God and man, and broken down the middle wall of separation. There was a wall between us and that wall was sin. And Jesus Christ became sin. And now Jesus Christ is the wall between me and God. Listen, it's not a person's sin that separates them from eternal life. It's not a person's sin that separates them from heaven. It's rejection of Jesus Christ, period. Your adultery, fornication, your drug addiction, murder, going to prison, all those things are not what separates you from God. Jesus died for all of that, but he didn't die for one particular sin. He left that to you, and that's rejection of himself. Whenever the Philippian jailer asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? Paul didn't say, quit beating people. Be nicer to people. No, he didn't say that. He said to this man that had beaten people for years, working for the government of, of Rome as well as there in Philippi, and he just simply said to him, believe on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you will be saved. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be good? And that's, he answered it, and he came right to the point and told him that's what you need to do. You're not going to go to hell because of all the sins you've committed. You're going to go to hell because you rejected Jesus Christ period. You're going to go to heaven, not because that, you know, not despite all these other things you've done, you're going to go to heaven for one reason. And that is the fact that you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And all those sins are not held against you. The one thing that brings you into heaven. And we're told in the closing of the book of Revelation, those names not found written in the book of life, those accepted Jesus are cast in the lake of fire. The so what's the dividing line? The book of life. Is your name in the book of life? Well, if you've accepted Jesus, it's there. If you've rejected Jesus, it's not there. So verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity or the division, the law of commandments contained in ordinance, so to create in himself one new man from two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity or the division. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off. And to those that were near, those that were afar off were the Gentiles. Those that were real close to salvation were Jews, but close doesn't mean you are saved. Verse 18, for through him, we both have access by one spirit to the father. What was God's main message to us? Peace. What is our main message to the world? Peace. What was God's main message to us? Peace through accepting Jesus Christ. That's our message to the world. The main thing we should be preaching in evangelism to the world is are you looking for peace? He brings internal peace, and then one day on this earth, he will bring all peace to the entire earth by accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I'll see you right after the break. I've been waiting on this book, Theology Simplified. This is a class I teach at Karis Bible College, and it's my favorite class. I think the students' favorite class is there. And I've been waiting to put this into a book. It's eight different theological terms that sound difficult, but actually are very simple. I just simply think the Bible sometimes is filled with complicated sounding words, but you break it down, it becomes very simple. This book is called Theology Simplified. Let me tell you what all it covers. It covers predestination. It covers reconciliation and sanctification. It covers glorification, justification. Redemption, propitiation, and election are all covered in this book. And again, big words with simple meanings. I bring it down to you. When I used to pastor at the church, I would even tell, I'd say, housewives, you that are listening out there today in the congregation, this is designed for you too. The word of God is not difficult. Even the Greek and the Hebrew were written on a third or fourth grade level where people can understand it. So that's what this is for. So, you know, this book will help and bless you tremendously as a person, as a, as a convert, and as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you teach a Bible class, if you teach a home cell group, or you're a pastor of a church or whatever, this book is for everybody and it's gonna greatly 
bless you. So I know you're gonna be blessed by getting this book and again, by growing in the things of God. Go to my website, bobyandian.com, and there you can purchase a copy for yourself. This will feed you for a lifetime. You can read it over and over again. And once you get it, one revelation, you'll say, wow, it was certainly worth the $15. So again, go to my website, bobyandian.com. You'll find how you can have a copy for yourself. Blessings upon blessings to you. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. As I said at the beginning of this teaching, peace and reconciliation are synonymous terms. Where you find one, you usually find the other, and even the uh, definition of the word reconciliation from the Greek is the procurement of peace between two warring parties. You know, my mom, when I was uh, growing up, me and my sister, she uh, got the uh, the uh, Reader's Digest every month, and she loved that magazine. Man, she read us funny stories and interesting stories, but one she read because she and my dad came from World War II. They met at the close of World War II and got married, but they, my dad had fought in the war, and my mom, of course, knew about the war. But after the war was over, I mean, that's when she got married to him and later on had us. But we were, I guess we were about seven or eight years old. And my mom brought in an article one day from Reader's Digest. I said, listen to this article, kids. She said, America, because we created the atomic bomb, was looking for a place to test other bombs. And so we bought an island way out in the Pacific Ocean. And this was so far from everything that if, if a nuclear weapon went off there, that the winds would just scatter, you know, the radiation everywhere. And, and literally it would be so uh, small by the time it reached anywhere, it would not be infectious. So they were looking and they finally found an island way out there so small and they decided, and they bought it. They bought this island, but they needed to go and check it out first. So they sent a few a few people out there to check the island out to see if where they could put the testing sites in a place, you know, where they could watch it from a building and all. The, I mean, all the stuff that they planned on. And when they got there, they were shot at. And they couldn't understand what was going on. There were some people there on the island that they thought was a deserted island and someone was shooting at them. And so they had to call back to the United States. We had to send some military out there. And when we found them, it was two Japanese soldiers on the island who didn't know the war was over. They had been sent to that island to protect it or to stop anybody from coming to it that could attack Japan. And they didn't know the war had been over. And so we had to finally capture them, hold them down, find someone that could speak Japanese and talk to them and tell them the war was over. They didn't believe it. They were taught that's why they were sent there was to protect the island. They were doing their job and they finally had to bring newsreels and show them pictures of the, the uh, emperor from Japan signing an unconditional surrender. And when they did, they were so shocked and they realized for something, they had been fighting a war for years that had ended. Listen, it's something to fight a war that was over 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago, but something else to fight a war that was over 2,000 years ago. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ went and stopped a war and the war was between man and God and the war is over. But the sad thing is there's still people today fighting God, thinking God is their enemy, treating God that way when God has reconciled the world to himself. Now he's simply waiting on you to give your life to Jesus Christ. God reconciled the world to himself, but we need to be reconciled to him. He did it to himself. Now we need to reconcile him to ourselves. In other words, he reconciled the world, but you still have a decision to make. Do you want to be reconciled? Will you accept his reconciliation? Will you accept his peace? And many people hear the gospel and walk off and say no, but I'm so glad even at five years old that I heard the gospel of peace and said yes to Jesus Christ and have learned to walk in that peace. I have learned to grow in that peace. And that's what God has done for me. Ephesians 6.15 says this, having your feet covered with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You know what this is saying? Same thing it said back in Isaiah 52.7. And that is how lovely on the mountains are the feet of them that bring glad tidings of peace. What we are to teach and what we are to take to the world is the message of reconciliation. Jesus Christ died for you and the war was over 2,000 years ago. 
And since that time, God has been at peace with mankind. And all he asks you to do is now be at peace with him. Reconciliation is part of Jesus' work on the cross. Colossians chapter one and verse 20 says this, by him, that's Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself, whether they be things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Notice in one verse, reconcile is mentioned, peace is mentioned at the end of this. And how is it done? By the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He reconciled us to God. And now we need to accept God and reconcile him to us. In other words, we need to accept it. Let me just put this as simple as possible. You know, I don't know if in your state where you live, they have a state lottery, but they do here in Oklahoma. My wife and I were driving under a, a sign one day and it said that the Oklahoma lottery was now up to $120 million. And so my, my, I told my wife, I said, wow, I said, you know, what would we do with $120 million? My wife laughed, said, well, first of all, the government would get half of it. I said, oh yeah, what would we do with $60 million? And we started, we started thinking, I said, man, wouldn't it be fun to write a tithe check to the church? I said, oh, why, why write a 10%? Why not write a 20%? After all, we would still have lots, millions of dollars left over and then put in an account to draw interest. We could buy ourselves a nice home, all this, but leave the rest of it there to draw interest and from that, as the interest comes, start giving to more ministries and have some for our kids. We went down the list of all those things. And then again, we stopped to think about it. You know, well, you know, we we don't usually gamble. It's, you know, whatever. You know, if you did it, you did it, you know. And But just imagine, say you did. Say you walked into a store, looked around because you're a Christian. Look, see if your pastor was in there and you went over and bought a ticket. And you went home that night and there it was. It's time for the uh, awards to be given and the money to be given. So you watched on, on TV and all those little ping pong balls are jumping up and down. And the first one lands, you look at your ticket and go, oh, that, that's my first number. And the next one, oh, that's my second number. <gasps> that's my third number. And the fourth one comes down, the ping pong ball lands, you go, that's my fourth number. And the fifth one comes up and you realize something. I have just won $120 million. You begin to shout, jump, jump all around, all that stuff. Your family comes and says, what happened? I said, look, look. And they show the number on there. You show them, look, I have the winning ticket right here. We won, we won, we won. And you sit back in your recliner and the family says, what are you doing? He says, well, if I won, they're going to put it straight into my checking account. And they go, no, no, no. You have to go claim it. No, I don't. Yes, you do. You have to take your winning ticket and go down there and show them that you are the right winner of this. He goes, no, I don't. I'm going to sit here and they're going to put it into my account. You can sit there all you want and they will not put it into your account. If you don't come claim it, they offer it to somebody else. I'm here to tell you when Jesus went to the cross, he announced the whole world has won, but you still have to go claim it. You can't just sit back and say, because Jesus died for me, I've been reconciled to God. Now I have peace with him. It's all been done. I don't have to do anything. No, we are told in the word of God, now you need to be reconciled to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look with me at the verse of scripture I'm talking about. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse 18 through 20. And here it tells us, now all things are of God. All things are from God who has past tense reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Why, how's that? That verse 19, that is, what is the ministry of reconciliation? That God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word or the ministry or the preaching of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Back there where it says Christ's behalf in that verse of scripture means literally in Christ's absence. When Jesus Christ left this earth, he left a hole there for just a moment and we begin to fill it on the day of Pentecost. 120 from the upper room now stood in that place of Jesus Christ and Jesus as an ambassador for God was taken out of this earth and now God has placed us in his, in his absence as ambassadors in this earth and gave us the same message of reconciliation. What Jesus preached, we preached. What did Jesus preach? Jesus Christ preached reconciliation to the world and not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word or the message of reconciliation. Why? Because as God was in Christ and through Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. He lives in us and he still wants to reconcile those that will listen to him and accept him. And we stand in Christ's presence, God in us like God was in him. And Jesus Christ was hauled up into heaven 
heaven. Now we stand in his place and we preach the same message with the same God living inside of us. And the message is we're not imputing your trespasses to you because God is it. All we have is one word to you, accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But I was a prostitute that Jesus died for that. But I, I murdered somebody. He died for that. I was sent to prison. He died for that. I, I, my life was terrible. I mean, I was a pimp. I was. I sold drugs. I was. A, I was the head of a mafia group. I mean, the list could go on and on. But in each case, no, no. He died for that. He died for the trespasses and doesn't impute those back to you. There's only one thing he didn't die for, and that's rejection of himself. And listen, God has reconciled you to Him, and now the winning ticket to show that you have won is simply accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And when you do, you are now reconciled to him. He's been reconciled to you, now you be reconciled to him. And that's again how we are born again. We come to God and claim what Jesus did for us on the cross. And what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross is he redeemed us, he reconciled us to the Father. Reconciliation is the removal of the barrier between God and man through the salvation work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And I can simply tell you, the barrier that was between me and God is now gone. I've been reconciled to God. And the one that did it is the one that stands between us. His name is Jesus Christ. He can, he can satisfy the claims of man because he is man, but he can satisfy the claims of God because he is God. He's the unique person of the universe. There's salvation and in no other name than through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. You might say, well, that's arrogance. Oh no, it's confidence. And we should, instead of saying, well, how do you stand up and be so arrogant thinking you're the way? We ought to stand up and say, thank you for telling us about all the other ways aren't the way and showing us the true way to come to God. Now, the direction of the Lord's ministry on the cross was threefold. First of all, toward God. That's the doctrine of propitiation. It's also toward sin. That's unlimited atonement. Everyone has been died for on the cross. And next of all, toward man. This is again the doctrine of reconciliation. The removal of the barrier between God and man and also between man and man. Jesus Christ was the barrier. There was sin was the barrier, but Jesus became the sin. And now Jesus Christ is the barrier between God and man. And listen, sin is not the issue. He died for it. But Jesus Christ is the issue. What are you going to do with him? And that's the only point of salvation. Therefore, not only did God remove the barrier between us and him, but once we're born again, the barriers between man and man disappear. What is that? Racial barriers, culture barriers, social barriers, political barriers, ideological barriers disappear. Socialist, capitalist, sexual barriers disappear. All the things that they're yelling and screaming about today isn't going to happen because you go get educated for it. Isn't going to happen because you simply decide to do it. It comes through a person. And Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 28 explains it. You are all sons of God and daughters through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ where there's neither Jew nor Greek. There is no racial barriers now with God. There is no slave nor free, no social barriers. There's neither male nor female. There is no gender barriers for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Aren't you glad? I am. See you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.